So on this slide, uh, what I want to go over is what is really the mechanism by which radiation occurs. I, I called it, that's a typo, it's not antenna types, it's radiation mechanisms. So how is radiation occurring in a antenna? How do we get a voltage and current to physically leave a transmission line? How do the electromagnetic fields generated by the voltage source, which are then contained and guided with the transmission line and antenna structure as a voltage and current waveform, detach from the antenna to travel in free space? That's the question. And so to begin answering this question, let's consider the infinite line charge that we've talked about uh, in previous lectures. And you remember from inf infinite line that this infinite line contains a charge density of uh, rho sub L, which is measured in coulombs per, per meter. Well, how much current is flowing if these, um, if these charges in this line are moving? We know that current is just equal to charge density in this infinitely thin wire times um, velocity. I know that many of you will see that as voltage, but in this, this uh, it's velocity, so I'll make it a little cursive. So units for current are amps. Uh, we know that charge densities units are coulombs per meter, and then velocity is meters per second. And so we get our basic definition of amps, which is coulombs per second, right? It's charge per second. So we see that this is an accurate definition of current right here. So what I want to do is uh, take this uh, current, and we're going to say that it has a, a non-zero derivative. And by that, I mean it, it has, it, it, it's AC. And it doesn't have to be sinusoidal, but it's just not, it's not constant. So we're going to take the derivative of that which is just di dt, the derivative of current, so this is non-zero. Well, ql, that's just charge density, that doesn't have any time dependency, so that's just going to be equal to ql if I take the derivative of the right-hand side of this equation. But I can take the derivative of velocity because that is a time-dependent quantity, so that's just dv dt over there. So if I take the derivative of the left side, I take the derivative of the right side, and I'm left with a linear charge density times the rate of change of velocity. Well, if you remember from your uh, physics days, we can say that di dt is equal to q sub l times acceleration, right? And so if this is, if instead of being infinite wire, it's all of length i, we just say that uh, we got dl di dt equals l times q sub l a. And so this equation right here is telling us that if we've got a length of wire that's got some sort of time varying current in it, what will happen is that we will get these uh, accelerated charges that are existing. And this is the fundamental mechanism by which radiation occurs, is that if we accelerate charge, if the charge has some sort of acceleration, which we can we can accomplish by creating a time derivative with respect to current, radiation will recur. So this is the fundamental mechanism of radiation. Accelerating charges, time variant currents, something like that. So this equation is implying to create radiation, there must be a time varying current or an acceleration of charge. So how do we get this situation to occur? If a wire carrying a current is curved, if it's bent, if it's discontinuous, if it's terminated, charge will experience some acceleration, right? If I am traveling with a constant velocity over a curved path, since it's a vector quantity, I'm, I'm experiencing acceleration. So I can just curve the path. I could bend it or something like that. And that creates acceleration. Also, if I have a straight wire and I put a periodic signal on it, like a uh, AC voltage, this is going to create charge acceleration. And so we create this time variant current creates charge acceleration. So we can therefore conclude that the idea of current flowing into an antenna is critical to the electromagnetic radiation. Time variant current flows into the antenna will cause an acceleration to the charges. Radiation will then occur due to the acceleration of this charge, due to either the source being AC, due to a bends and wire, due to a load termination, or something like that. So therefore, the conditions that exist for radiation to occur So 
So if we've got charge not moving, that means there's no current, right? If charge is moving, then we have current. There's no radiation. What if we have charge moving with constant velocity? Well, if it's in a straight line, so a DC current, no radiation because there's no acceleration. What if it is curved? Discontinuous, bent, whatever. Radiation occurs because the charge is seeing this form of acceleration. Finally, charge moving with constant, with, uh, let's say, dVdt not equal to zero. So a non-constant velocity, radiation will occur. So this doesn't, this, this could imply this situation here, or it could imply an AC signal on a straight wire. So typically the acceleration of charge is going to be achieved by bending a wire or by driving it with an AC source. One interesting conclusion from this analysis is that radiation is, occur, is going to occur whenever a charge is oscillating, even if the wire is straight. So anytime you put an AC signal into a wire, you actually are creating antenna. So now let's go to these images that I have up here and consider a voltage source connected to a, a line like a, a twin lead. Applying a voltage to the uh, like the twin lead line is going to create an electric field between the conductors, which I've shown here. Um, the line of, of electric field you can see are going to um, uh, the intensity of the electric field is going to vary with the AC signal, and uh, I've shown this uh, by spacing the lines differently. And also, since it's AC, the direction of the lines is going to flip. So I've shown that with these little arrows. So since current is flowing, a magnetic field is also going to surround the current carrying a T line. So assuming that the, this voltage here is sinusoidal, the E field inside of the T line will, is also going to be sinusoidal. And it will have the same frequency and the same period as this source. Um, and again, I've indicated the relative magnitude of the electric field lines by the density and the relative direction is shown by the arrowhead. So in this top image, what we're showing there is time variant and electromagnetic fields are formed between the conductors in a transmission line, which are going to travel along the transmission line from the source to the load, creating current and therefore voltage as they travel. If we were to remove part of the antenna structure, um, free space waves are formed by connecting the opened end of the T-line um, with the, with the electric field line. So basically what we're saying is um, these E field lines, as we start to pull apart this open circuit, still have to point from the, uh, the positive to the minus here. They're the minus sign here. These um, free space waves are also periodic and are going to move outward, as we're showing uh, in this picture right here. And they're going to move outward and away from this antenna structure at the speed of light. But how does how do these waves that have physically detached from this antenna structure, or how do they physically detach from this antenna structure? Uh, to better understand this, let's look at a specific case of an antenna, which is called the, uh, the dipole antenna. So what we've done here is we've just taken a transmission line, and you can see in this we've kind of curved it. Well, in this image, we've taken this curve to a lot, an extreme of 90 degrees, and we form what's called a half-wave dipole. So um, by bending the ends of this transmission line at 90 degrees, we've created this half-wave dipole. Since the EM wave is traveling at the speed of light um, at a period of lambda over 4, the E field will have uh, traveled a distance of lambda over 4 in our example here, we're, we're showing um, the time uh, The time is T divided by 4, where T is the period. I have three lines of electric field. 
since I'm showing that this corresponds to the peak value of the sinusoid, this is showing the electric field at its maximum value. During the second quarter of the period, the original three field lines are going to have traveled an additional lambda over four meters for a total distance of lambda over two meters from the antenna. At this point in time, though, the total E field on the antenna uh, must be zero. As the driving voltage source here uh, has gone through a zero transition. So how does this occur? How do we get total E-field lines if these things are still coupled to the antenna here? Well, this can kind of be thought of as being accomplished by introducing these opposite charges that neutralize the charge along the conductor. These lines of force created by this neutralizing charge, I've shown here as dashed lines in the diagram, and they're opposite in direction to the original E-field line. So these dashed lines are these neutralizing charges, and these curved lines are these original um, lines of E-field. These neutralizing charges are going to travel a distance of lambda over 4 during this second quarter of the first half cycle. The result is going to be that the three lines of force are pointing, out li out, uh, pointing downwards and three lines of force are uh, pointing upwards. These lines of force are then kind of, kind of going to combine the up and the down lines of force are going to combine and since there's no charge on the antenna the E field has totally decoupled from the conductor and the field lines have united into forming these closed loops that we show here. During the second half of the period the sinusoidal of the sinusoidal source the same process is repeated but in the opposite direction and after that the process is repeated indefinitely over and over and over. So I now need to make a critical observation regarding the formation of these closed loops of electric field. Uh, since they have decoupled, they're no longer dependent on this voltage source here. So these lines have decoupled, they're no longer dependent on this voltage source. And this is to say that the EM wave that has decoupled will continue to radiate away from the antenna even after the voltage source is turned off, even after that is no longer on. And we can kind of consider the analogy of waves created in water. If I toss a pebble into a calm body of water, the water waves are going to be created, which begin to travel outwardly. Um, once the disturbance has been initiated, the waves do not stop if the source of the disturbance of, if, is removed. If, however, the disturbance persists, new waves will be continuously formed with lag behind the others. And EM waves behave exactly same, the same way. If the initial electrical disturbance is short, the created EM wave will travel inside of the transmission line and then into the antenna and are finally radiated as waves, even if the electric source has ceased to exist. If the electric source instead is continuous, new electromagnetic waves are going to be continually formed and traveling behind these others. Um, and for completeness, I just want to point out that I'm showing radiation in one direction. Uh, that's that's just a simplification, graphical simplification. Um, dipoles actually radiate in two directions, not just one. And we'll explain these radiation shapes uh, in much more detail. But I just wanted to get you kind of a conceptual overview of how radiation actually occurs.